Hey everyone, my name is Dan Nisri, uh, and I am an Android developer at Yodel. And today I'll be talking about Kotlin. So uh, first I'll go into like the basics of the language and some of the cool language features uh, and how it compares to other languages and why it's interesting for Android specifically. Um, and then a quick overview of the sample app I wrote for this talk. So first, um, Kotlin is an open source programming language that is developed by JetBrains, which is the company that is responsible for uh, IntelliJ. So it's statically typed, just like Java, which means the compiler enforces types. Um, and the big call out here is that it's 100% interoperable with Java, which means you can use any co uh, Java classes or methods from within Kotlin code and vice versa. Um, so the first big question I had was, why would JetBrains you know, invest all the time and energy into making a new programming language when there's Java and alternatives? So uh, according to them, the main reason was that A, you know, Java, they couldn't be as productive as they wanted to be, um, and B, the other alternative languages out there were not, uh, were either too complex, according to them, or they didn't interact with their existing Java code base as well as they wanted to. So they're introducing Kotlin. And this is a mostly exhaustive list of all the features in Kotlin. Um, and we'll go through a couple of them today. So the first is called data classes. And it really speaks to the conciseness of the language. So I'm sure everyone's familiar here with uh, these kind of you know, classes on the left in Java. We have private fields, constructor, getters, setters, all that stuff. Um, and in Kotlin, you can achieve the same exact functionality in one line by using a data class. So uh, here we basically have the primary constructor and we're passing in the fields and Kotlin will generate the rest of the code for us. Um, and so we've seen in past meetups, so you can use stuff like auto value in Java, but uh, it's nice that this is actually built into the language itself. And the other thing you get is a copy function, which can be useful at times. So uh, here you can see we are creating an instance of the person class and we can call copy on it and use Kotlin's named parameters. So we're just saying copy the person and set the email to a new value, keep all the old values from the old fields. So um, that's definitely really useful at times. And there are some limitations. So you can't have an abstract or open data class, which means you can't extend from them. Um, however, in Kotlin 1.1, they will lift that restriction. So you could have uh, like data class hierarchies if you wanted to. So the next major feature is called null safety. And uh, null, the idea of null is often referred to as the billion dollar mistake. Um, and that's because of all the time that developers have spent uh, like debugging and fixing null pointer exceptions um, and kind of uh, all the general damage that has happened in applications and software because of them. So Kotlin tries to fix this problem by obviating the, uh, the possibility of a null pointer exception even happening. So the way they do that is by uh, requiring you to specify every time you create a reference or object if it's nullable or non-null. And then later on when you try to use the object, the compiler uh, enforces you to basically check it for null. So just to go through some examples, um, here we can see this is how you would create a new string variable. And by default, everything is non-null. So when you try to set the string to null, the compiler will yell at you and you can't run this code. Um, so if you did want to set the value to null, you would append the question mark to the type definition and then you could set it to null. So once you have a null, nullable variable, um, as soon as you try to access any fields on it, the compiler also does this, which means uh, you have to basically check that field for null before you access it. And you could surround this with an if statement or you could use Kotlin's null safe operator. So it's, it's a lot more concise. And uh, the way this works is if the string variable is null, then the whole expression will return null and you can continue. And the last example here is uh, if you wanted to provide a default value for in the case of null. So you could use the if else like this or use what's called the Elvis operator. Uh, and it's because it's a little like emoji with the, the hair flip on the side. So uh, in this case, if string is null, then it will default to the value of zero. Um, so that's pretty useful. And then uh, in this example, I know uh, we have a lot of this kind of code in our Android app. Um, basically, we have a bunch of nested objects, and we only want to do something if all of the objects are not null. 
so in Java, you pretty much just end up with this, you know, nested block of if statements. And in Kotlin, you can do the exact same thing in one line, um, just by chaining the, the null safe operator. So, uh, so here, the way this works is if any of the objects in the chain are null, the expression will just stop executing and department name would just be null at, after this line. Um, yeah. So that's it for safety. And then the next part of the language is how it supports functional concepts. So, uh, you know, Java 8 introduced lambdas, which are awesome and really useful. Um, but the way it's implemented is with what's called a SAM type conversion. Um, and that stands for single abstract method. So what this means is that every lambda you define has to have a corresponding interface that represents it with the same uh, definition. So for instance here, if you wanted to define a function that doubles as input, you would use the function interface and say that it takes in an integer and returns an integer. Um, and so the point of this is really just to say that uh, there's actually no try function in Java, so if you wanted to define a volume function for some reason, you'd have to make that interface and, uh, you know, it, it would kind of be a little, uh, a little more code. So in Kotlin, they actually have support for proper function types. So this is kind of like the equivalent of the Java code above. Um, here we define functions with curly braces, and there are no interfaces that represent these functions. They're just the function type in Kotlin. Um, and this is also more concise because the Kotlin compiler is a little smarter about types. So here you can see it's not actually defining what type of things uh, these variables are. It's just being inferred by the right-hand side. So you get to write a bit less code like that as well. So now that we've talked about functions, uh, we can talk about higher-order functions, which is basically just a fancy way of saying a function that either takes another function as an argument or returns a function as the result. So the most common example of these are map, filter, and reduce. Um, and these are really great because they let you write code that expresses what it's trying to accomplish instead of how it's being done. So just to go over a quick example, um, here let's say we have a list of people objects. And what we want to do is extract all of their names, sort them, and uh, also exclude anyone named Bob. So this is how you would do it procedurally. Um, you know, create a new list, iterate, do your if statement, and then add the name, and then sort. Uh, but we can do the same exact thing in Kotlin uh, with a little more functional paradigm. So here, we're calling filter on the list and passing in a lambda. So uh, in Kotlin, basically, if there's one parameter to the lambda, then you can just use the word it. So it looks a little weird here at first, but once you're used to it, uh, it's definitely like more concise and quick to write. So this this code block will do the exact same thing as this in terms of what it outputs. Um, the one main difference is that uh, on the right side, this would actually iterate through the list twice, which might not be obvious at first, but that's because we're calling filter and map on the list. And so to do the same kind of thing as, as the left in terms of performance, um, we can use the as sequence method, which returns a lazy collection, and then you can apply transformations and then call two lists at the end, so it would just iterate once. Um, and that's very similar to the Java 8 streaming API. So uh, the next feature was, was kind of the one that really was the most mind-blowing for me coming from Java, um, and it's called extension functions. So what this means is basically a, uh, you can add functionality to existing classes without actually modifying the class itself. And it comes in really handy when you want to, you know, add functionality to classes that you don't have control over, like uh, classes that are part of the language or part of the SDK you're working with. So, for example, you can add functions to the string class. Um, and this kind of removes the need for all these utils classes that we see on Android a lot. Um, and it makes the code a lot easier to read. So in this first example, um, on the right is a screenshot from the sample app. And what it's doing is extracting the primary uh, color from this image and setting it as the background for this view. So on the left here in Kotlin, you know, you kind of have to know the details of how to get a bitmap from the image view and then pass it to the palette library. And then you can call generate, which is the, the function you actually care about. So to clean this up a bit, um, 
we can basically define an extension function on the image view class. So you do that by saying image view dot and then the name of the function that you want to define. Um, and then you can kind of throw the annoying code inside of this function and reference this as the instance of the image view we're extending. So once we have this defined, we can literally just write this code, um, basically calling the method on the image view as if it was part of that class originally. Um, and this is a lot more clean and kind of lets you focus on the thing that's, that's really important. And the next extensions example is called the nullable receiver. So uh, you can actually define an extension function on a nullable type itself. So here, uh, we can actually check the string for null inside of the function. So what this means is that if we have a nullable string, we can call the method even though the string is null and it won't throw a null pointer exception. Whereas in Java, uh, there's really nothing you can do besides checking for null before you use a method. So um, this, this definitely can be useful. Uh, so that's it for the language features and now kind of for the comparison to other languages. So we've seen a lot about Java and the next language that always comes up in discussion with Kotlin is Scala. So um, Kotlin is definitely a lot less complex and less feature rich than Scala. Um, and because of that, JetBrains is able to you know, provide a really high level of, of tooling and support for the language. Um, and also, the interop between Java and Kotlin works really well versus uh, Scala, which has some problems. So, um, and I, I threw closure on here to kind of represent the, the level of like functional languages in, in, J, in the JVM. Um, so it kind of goes Java and then Kotlin is a little more functional than Scala than Clojure. And I put Swift on here as well because um, there have been rumors that Google is looking at Swift for Android. Um, but obviously, it'd have to do a lot of work to make that possible, whereas Kotlin targets the JVM, so it's possible today. Um, and the next interesting question I thought was, why is Android being targeted so heavily for Kotlin? Um, and I think the primary reason is that, you know, because of the fragmentation of the Android OS, uh, basically, we, the Android community has to wait a long time before we can adopt the latest Java features. So. Uh, for instance, Java 8 was released over two years ago now, and only in the coming months is it being like fully or partially supported. Um, whereas Kotlin can compile back down to Java 6, meaning you can use all the language features on any version of Android, even back to the first version. Um, so that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. And then the next thing is that uh, Android developers are always conscientious of the size of the libraries they're dependent on. So like compared to Scala, Kotlin is about 10 times smaller. Um, and actually, because of the way functions are implemented, you can lower the method count overall uh, compared to the same exact code in Java with something like inline functions. Um, and then again, because of how well it interops with Java, it's really easy to set up in your Android project. Um, and actually, the last thing is something that the JetBrains team even spent more time developing on, which was, uh, it's called Kotlin Android Extensions. So this is a pretty cool plugin for, for Android development in Kotlin. Um, the way it works is let's say we have a cell on the right and we're trying to kind of bind the data to it. Um, after you enable the plugin, you can just put an import line in your Kotlin file for the XML file. So it has the same name of the XML file here. And then uh, basically in Android Studio, uh, the Kotlin Android extensions plugin will inject these synthetic properties on either the view or the activity, whatever you're importing into. Um, so this kind of removes the need for, you know, finding views by ID or even annotating them with IDs and, and using butter knife or something like that. So um, even kind of less code with this example. And as I mentioned, it's super easy to get started. Uh, all you have to do is enable the Kotlin plugin in Android Studio and run this one task and it'll just update your Gradle file and then you can write Kotlin code. Um, and then this is kind of a quick overview of the sample app if you're interested in checking it out. Um, so it just kind of searches all the uh, repositories on GitHub and does some cool animations. So uh, it uses a lot of the standard libraries that we see on Android development um, and also some testing. So uh, it's a, it should be pretty easy to follow and, and should be a good starting point if you're interested. 
And just to summarize real quick, so benefits we've seen, conciseness because of things like data classes, uh, safety because of how null is handled, productive and expressiveness because of how it supports functions, um, interoperability with Java is really good, and because JetBrains backs it, it's, uh, the IDE support is, is top notch. So uh, on the negative side, some risks are obviously that it's less standard than Java. So um, you know, if you're hiring new people that don't know Kotlin, they'll have to learn it. But luckily, the, the learning curve is pretty um, comparatively small compared to other languages. And another thing is, you know, online, there's going to be less Stack Overflow posts um, about Kotlin versus Java. And the good thing, though, is that you can use all the existing libraries out there. So in some sense, you get a lot of the community. Um, and then another thing is that Google hasn't really come out and said that Kotlin is officially supported for Android. So um, until they kind of adopt it, I would say that's, that's a little bit of a risk. Um, and for example, because of that, uh, like instant run is not enabled yet on Kotlin. So you'll kind of lag behind in, in the build tools a little bit. Uh, and here are some interesting links. So highly recommend the JetBrains documentation for Kotlin. It's really good. And as I mentioned, I work at Yodel. Um, we do some pretty cool things for small businesses. So if you're interested, come find me after. And the last thing I want to address is why it's called Kotlin, which is uh, apparently it's named after this island off the coast of St. Petersburg, um, where the JetBrains team primarily develops the language. So uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Any questions? <laughs>